This is going to be a slight digression on the topic of competence and incompetence in light of the arbitrary episode 11. The digression concerns anti-Semitism. If you want to be incompetent quickly, become anti-Semitic. If you want to be punished by God, become anti-Semitic. Now the kind of punishment that you get into with anti-Semitism is mental illness. Mental illness means that you will manufacture a reality that isn't there. If enough people are manufacturing the same fake reality, then they will not be able to detect the fact that they're mentally ill. Anti-Semitism is something that Satan sponsors. So because he sponsors it, there is a lot of it everywhere. I mean everywhere. And it's in every kind of flavor you want to name. It's obvious in the Muslims. It's obvious in the Quran. It's obvious in like the Ku Klux Klan and Christian identity and some of these other groups. But it's rampant everywhere. So you want to be real careful to do a reality check about the beliefs that you have for anti-Semitism because the extent that you have anti-Semitic beliefs even if you don't know that's what they are you will be retarded you will not become competent okay over time God makes you aware of that you know the anti-Semitism that's lurking in various and sundry things but if you want to get on the fast track of the spiritual life you better know them now so ask God, I'm going to list some of them so you can get a heads up. But ask God about, you, you know, well, do I have any beliefs that are anti-Semitic? Okay, that you really want to do that. It's a real important thing to do. Because if you value your time, you don't want to be going down a road that's concealed anti-Semitism. Because that's going to retard your spiritual life. I'm going to highlight some of the areas where anti-Semitism is really strong but isn't quite so obvious. Okay, First place, and we're going to pick politics first because that's easy to spot, the whole Palestinian thing. The Palestinians are a criminal people. They've been a criminal people for 2,000 years. The, today's so-called Palestinians are really not Palestinians. Palestine is a word that the Romans came up with based on Peleset, which were Greek sea peoples who came to the area, to the Levant, around 1200 B.C. or so, some a little bit earlier. They were always marauders. They were rapists. They were terrorists. They made their living terrorizing caravans. Okay? That's what they did. And they stayed in the area because the, the path that we know as Israel was a major trade route always because it's the nexus of three continents. And those were the people that, that when God called out you know, the exodus, those were the people that God has specifically wanted wiped out. And you know the strongest language in the Old Testament is reserved for that takeover when Israel was supposed to go into the land. God said, wipe out every man, woman, child, even kill the livestock. Now, there were two reasons why God ordered it that way. The first was to let the people know that he was real serious about this because in the old days, when you went to war, you were doing it for profit taking. You were doing it to capture the women, capture the goods, make slaves out of the people, Okay, it wasn't really designed to kill. It was designed to take control over another people. So by ordering to kill everybody, including the livestock, God was making it plain that it was 
an order from God. It was not the typical kind of warring that was going on in the Middle East at that time. That, that God was declaring vengeance against them. Okay? Because there's no profit taking. The second reason God did it is that these, when, when you get into a criminal mindset, there is a point of no return. There is no redemption. I'm not talking about you can't believe in Christ to be saved. And the soul just will not ever recover. It loves crime too much. And you can reach that stage at age 5. You can reach it at age 7. Okay, there are lots of stories, even today, about kids killing their parents. Okay, you can be very young and develop a criminal mindset very young. And in the Levant in those days, the people practiced child burning. They would burn their kids. They would sacrifice them to Kamosh, a.k.a. Baal, which was usually depicted by a statue with its arms held out, either sitting or standing. And you put a baby or a child in the arms of that statue and you lit it on fire alive and you were supposed to have sex while the child screamed this is the kind of people they were they skinned people alive they had contests they'd stake people out on the ground and they'd have contests to say see which victim stayed alive the longest while they skinned them alive the Hittites were famous for that okay but it wasn't just the Hittites these people practice the most horrible lifestyle you can imagine. They burn their own kids. Okay, that was to them, you know, a, a holy thing to do. And of course they had temple prostitution and all the other kinds of stuff that the pagan religions had in them. Drugs. Okay, they thought nothing of rape. The king would take any woman he wanted. Okay. And, you know, being. They could rape you right there on the spot. Nobody could say anything about it. It's just a question of who's stronger. And people would kill each other over a cup of flour. This is the kind of people who lived in Israel at the time that God ordered the Exodus. They were the scourge of the earth at that time. They still are and they survive as Palestinians. Palestinian kids learn in grammar school how to make bombs to throw at Jews. There was an interview with either uh, Jane Pauley or Diane Sawyer. I want to say it was like in 2005, 2006. I've been trying to find it so that I could buy it. Where two Palestinian kids are sitting on benches talking to her, telling her that they learned how to make bombs. Of course, you can just look on YouTube and find all the the... You know, the memory TV likes to, you know, you know, show those videos where the Muslims are constantly telling you to bomb the Israelis. And, of course, the PLO Charter, number one article, is that Israel has no right to exist. These people are dead set. They abuse their own kids. They have sex with their own daughters when they're children. That's the Muslim religion. They abuse their children. They strap bombs on five-year-old kids. We've all seen the pictures, and if you if you haven't, just you know, query in YouTube on Memory TV because they they happen to you know specialize in that kind of video. But so do a lot of others. And these are live videos by the Muslims in their own words, themselves talking. You're not to, you know it's not third party. You're seeing it for yourself, firsthand. Okay, that's what anti-Semitism does. And God caused those people to be wiped out, wanted Israel to wipe them all out. Israel refused to do that. And because of that, as it says in Deuteronomy, God let a, a book of Judges, first part of the book of Judges, God ended up letting them live so that they would continue to be a scourge to Israel and remind her of what she didn't do. There's a time and a place when you have to kill people. Okay? And when you don't learn that lesson, well, then they kill you. All right? Anti-Semitism is geared for that goal, to kill Israel. So any doctrine that you buy into that has any element of anti-Semitism in it, God's going to end up 
you know, spanking you for that. So here's what the doctrines are. And when you hear them, you're going to just fall over. First and number one doctrine of anti-Semitism, it's very subtle, is to deny the pre-trib rapture. To deny or disbelieve in it. Pretty much, I want to say 80% of Christianity does that. Pre-trib rapture is based on the fact that time is owed to Jews. The time vested in Christ when he died on the cross. That's what Galatians 3 is explaining. So you are anti-Christ if you don't believe in pre-trib rapture. Now you can say, well, I'm not sure it's true. I need to see proof. That's fine. Keep an open mind then until you've done your homework. But don't say it's not true. Okay, because you don't know it's that it's true. That's the closest you can come to be honest. Because all the people who are trying to claim that it's not true are anti-Semitic. All of Catholicism, almost all of Calvinism, there are exceptions, are preterist. Preterist says that church is, is, takes the place of Israel. It's based on replacement theology. Calvin was a virulent anti-Semite. And you can read his own sermons on Daniel 9 and see that. Catholicism is virulently anti-Semitic. We've got a history of pogroms, you know, just to show that, but you don't even need that. They deny that the future belongs to the Jews. It does belong to the Jews because it belongs to Christ. Seven years and then a thousand fifty years, they call it a thousand, because the thousand fifty is divided into thousand plus fifty years at the end. That belongs to Christ, a total of ten fifty seven years. And I've spent the uh, last four years now documenting how you can prove all that from Bible. I spent the last 12 years documenting the pre-trib rapture from the Bible. Okay, it's, it's essentially uh, a subunit of the doctrine of how God orchestrates time. And I got punished by God because I was bored with the pre-trib rapture. So if I got punished by God, and that's why I had to spend the last 12 years the way I did, for just being bored with a doctrine I properly believed in, what do you think is going to happen to you? Okay? So, pay real close attention to anybody who denies pre-trib rapture. Now, here's who denies it. All of Catholicism, most Calvinists, most Reformed, JWs, SDA, a lot of the KJVO, Okay, and I'll get into other reasons why KJVO is anti-Semitic in, in a few minutes. Okay, and, well, golly, almost Lutherans. If you're in any of those denominations, you're in an anti-Semitic denomination. It's founded on anti-Semitism. Catholicism is, in fact, founded on anti-Semitism. That's what, you know got its rise in. You can read that really for yourself just by studying church history. Hegesippus wouldn't know the Old Testament if his life depended on it. Okay? So read the church fathers and you'll see the anti-Semitism. Start with uh, Justin Martyr in his dialogue with Trifo. That's about the most virulent anti-Semitic piece that you can read in early Christianity. Then there's John Chrysostom he is a piece of work. Luther, of course, was anti-Semitic. And Calvin is terribly anti-Semitic. Not as bad as Luther. Okay, so if, if you're involved in any of those denominations, you're, you're basically founded on anti-Semitism. Because they all cut the Jew out of history, and, that, and everything that is Israel is vested in Christ now. That's what the cross did. It did two things. It birthed church... And it uh, finished off the vesting for Israel, and that's covered in Galatians 3 and 5. The whole book of Galatians is on the two walls. And then Paul, of course, covers that again in Ephesians 2. And Ephesians 1 explains the timeline of the rapture being pre-trip. He was using different benchmarks. Well, what if the rapture happens this year? What if it happens this year? And then the text of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 tells you how to characterize that period if it happens or if it doesn't. It's really clever. Very, very clever. 
Um, so pre denying pre-trib rapture is number one. And pretty much, you know, 80% of Christianity denies it. So you want to be real careful about that. At least hold an open mind until you do your homework and find out just how true the uh, pre-trib rapture is. And it's not the way even those who believe in the rapture depict it. That's the second thing. Um, most people who believe in pre-trib rapture don't even understand what it is. It's a judgment for church. Church goes up because church is so apostate, God has to end it. It's Romans 11. Paul already explained it in Romans 11. Be careful lest you be grafted out. And at the end, the Jews will be grafted back in. That's what he says in Romans 11. But nobody's paying attention. Okay? That's why the rapture happens. It's judgment of church. It's a bad thing. Not a good thing. I mean, it's happy that we get to see the Lord and everything, because, you know, you can't lose your salvation. But after that comes the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, I explained that in my... Um, humanity's advocate video because he didn't understand the preacher of rapture either he believes in it but he doesn't know what he believes he doesn't know what it really is so I had to briefly explain it it's judgment and during the tribulation during those seven years the earth is being judged on earth and then we're being judged by Christ in heaven standing right before him and like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 if you know God did it to you then you'll be rewarded. And if you did it to yourself, then all your works will be burnt up, but you'll be saved as though through fire, because the works got burnt, not you. And that's in 1 Corinthians 3. You can read it yourself. And the Humanities Advocate video showed that passage. Okay? So, the tribulation is not a good thing. It's something you should be afraid of. Because what if it happened today? Did you learn God as much as you should? We're all going to be held accountable for how well we learned and used Bible. That's the deal. The deal. And that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 3. The work is the work of the Word, which only the Holy Spirit can do in you. Only God can make gold. There's no such thing as alchemy. Only God can make silver. There's no such thing as alchemy. Only God can make precious stones. They only occur in nature. So only God can make them. Now, are you going to be God produced or are you going to be you produced? That's what 1 Corinthians 3 is about and that's how you're judged. Well, you're God produced if you're learning and living on Bible. Because only God can make you learn and live on it. You can't do it yourself. You cannot read the Bible yourself and learn it. The Holy Spirit has to teach you, and then he hires some teacher that he's appointed for you as your teacher. And you have to find out who that is by asking God to point him out to you. You don't do that. Ephesians 4.16 is the procedure. You don't do that. Then you're in deep doo-doo, honey. Okay? And you will become anti-Semitic as a result. You'll fall in for anti-Semitic doctrines. Pro-life is another anti-Semitic doctrine. The Jews have always known, and it's real painfully obvious in the Hebrew and the Greek of the Old Testament, that life begins at birth. Why? Because God makes you. You don't make yourself. The womb doesn't make you anything. There's no human life in the womb. There's body parts developing. That's the theme. Um, and I've covered that in Psalm 139. I've not yet finished all the videos because that, that psalm is mistranslated. But David's whole point in Psalm 139 is that he wasn't a human being until he was born. And he's amazed that God would go to the trouble of authorizing a, a body for him. Just like Christ said at in, in Hebrews 10.5, a body you prepared for me. For me, the me is not the same as the body. Okay, the me is the soul. The real you is your soul, not your body. Your body is never, we call it human because it's a whole package, but the body is not really the human being. The human being is your soul. The body is a house you walk around in. That's David's point in Psalm 139. So if you're pro-life, you're anti-Semitic. 
Because the Jews know this doctrine. And David Duke in particular knows that the Jews know this doctrine. That you're not human until born. And David Duke is busy, you know, trying to court people into his anti-Semitic campaign by correctly citing the fact that Jews all know from the Bible that you're not human until you're born. So, you want to get discipline from God? Be pro-life. Abortion is not murder. God ordered abortion in Numbers 527. Did you learn it? I did it in my pro-life blasphemy series. You can see I show the lexicons where the scholars even know God's ordering an abortion. And one scholar in the lexicons I show live on screen was speculating whether the woman was already pregnant with some other man's kid, that God would order the abortion like that. Okay? So pro-life is another anti-Semitic doctrine. Pre-trib rapture disbelieved anti-Semitism. Pro-life believed is anti-Semitism. Now you wouldn't expect either one of those to be anti-Semitic. But they are. KJVO is the third one. I promise they get to it. KJVO is founded on the idea that the Bible, God is so inept he couldn't get it right until 1611 and the Hebrew and the Greek texts are corrupt and one big branch of the King James only people maintained that the Greek LXX wasn't written by the Jews, but it was written by Origen three centuries later. Okay, then that makes your entire King James Bible a hoax. Because the New Testament in the Greek quotes the Greek Old Testament at least a thousand times that I could find. It's on every, uh, every page contains quotes. Okay, many quotes whether it's direct quoting or indirect quoting of the LXX. Okay, the LXX is the name for the Greek Old Testament that the Jews translated for a pharaoh around 273 BC. And the only problem with it was that there was some ding-dong named Aristeus who came along about a 50, or century late, 50 years or a century later who tried to claim that the LXX was inspired. No, it's not inspired. It's a translation. But it was translated by Jews. And it's based on older Hebrew manuscripts, so that's what makes it important to look at. And sometimes the LXX is right, and the Hebrew text we today have is wrong. So we know that they had an older Hebrew text. It's really useful. And it's quoted by Christ and the Apostles and all the writers of the scripture um, at least a thousand times that I know of. Okay. So, the King James Bible is based on anti-Semitism. King James Onlyism is based on anti-Semitism. The King James translators were not anti-Semitic. Well, actually they were. But that's kind of beside the point. They were preterists for the most part. And preterism is based on anti-Semitism. Cuts the Jew out of history. Which is 80% of Christianity. Okay? But that doesn't mean that everything in the King James Bible is bad. Far from it. I mean, most of your translators are, are preterists. So they're anti-Semitic. And that's one reason why translations have so many mistakes. Is because, you know, the penalty for anti-Semitism is that you don't grow spiritually. Well, if you don't grow spiritually, then when you read Bible, you don't read it well. You make mistakes in reading it. Or you read it at a five-year-old's level, and therefore you can't translate it properly. And that's what happens. Okay? That's why Bible translation to this day, you know, even if it were possible to translate it accurately, um, is at least 50% inaccurate. That's why you've got to go to the original text, which the King James only people deny. Because they want to cut the Jews out. And their leaders are all anti-Semitic even when they claim to be pro-Semitic because of this claim of theirs that the Hebrew and Greek texts are corrupt. Okay? They're doing that because, and, and they, as, you know, they disparage and they, they invent slander and even libel, technically libel because it's in print, against Bible scholars of the past in order to make the Hebrew and Greek, you know, make you not trust the Hebrew and Greek texts that we have. They have no clue 
about textual criticism. They cannot read the Hebrew and Greek, none of them. There's not one single King James only person on the planet who can really read the Hebrew and Greek. And you know how I can prove that right away, immediately? None of them know the meter. None of them know the Hebrew meter. If they knew the Hebrew meter, they'd know right away that there's a serious flaw in the King James Bible because the King James translators didn't know the meter. I've been proving the meter now for five years. Okay? If the Hebrew and Greek is metered with timelines that prophesy Christ's coming on an exact schedule year by year, and that's exactly what's been going on in the Old Testament ever since Moses. If you got Hebrew meter prophesying the timeline with the text to match the syllable count so that you could plot the calendar of Messiah's arrival, well, then how come the King James translators didn't know that? You see? And therefore you can't say that a translation is better than the original because none of the translations reference the meter. And it's all over the Old Testament. And it's even in the New Testament. As I've been covering in Paul, the Magnificat, Revelation, John's Revelation is partly metered. And other passages like Hebrews 11.1, 1, Philippians 3.14, there are a whole bunch of passages that are metered. Just, you have prose and then all of a sudden, bing, you've got a passage that's metered because it's telling you something about time. It'll take me the rest of my life and I still won't finish, you know, documenting all the passages because there are so many. Well, okay, King James only people don't know the meter. Well, then God is not in them. And why don't they know the meter, but even a brain out does? Well, because I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm not better than them as a person, but I'm not anti-Semitic, so my spiritual growth isn't stunted like theirs is. See, spiritual growth doesn't depend on the person. It depends on God doing it to you. But he's not going to do it to you if you're anti-Semitic. If you're anti-Semitic, you're carnal. Well, the Holy Spirit isn't going to fill a carnal person. You have to name your sins to God. I use 1 John 1, 9 like breathing. So if you suspect you might be anti-Semitic, you better start using it also. Now, there are some other doctrines about that are anti-Semitic that are a little more obvious. Um, you know, the whole idea... For example, and this is just, uh, you know, so simple, it, it's almost embarrassing. The idea that Revelation 7 is referring to Christians rather than to um, the Jews. The Jews are mentioned by tribe there, please. Origen famously held that Revelation 7 referred to Christians. And Catholicism holds that view, and so did Cal does Calvinism for the most part. Not all Calvinists are um, preterists. Most of you are Reformed, Lutheran, etc. They all hold to that. Okay, well, when you have a passage that so boldly and baldly mentions the Jews by tribe in Revelation 7, it's not allegorical. It's literal. And there are 144,000 Jews who are an entourage to Christ by Revelation 14. In Revelation 7, first three and a half years of the tribulation, they're the evangelists for the, those first three and a half years. In the last three and a half years, they've been martyred already, and they're his personal entourage forever. They're Jews. They're not Gentiles. In the Old Testament, you were a Jew if you believed in Christ as he was unrevealed. In the, in the New Testament, it's the same thing, except you get to be called Christian until the rapture happens, at which point you're called a Jew again. It's always believing in Christ, but you're, the name that you're called by is something else. Okay, well, there are, 20, there are 40, 144,000 Jews mentioned by tribe. Okay, so all your JWs are anti-Semitic even if they don't regard themselves that way, because they think that, that that Revelation 7 refers to some select group among them. Okay? So, if you can't read the bald Jewish tribe naming in Revelation 7, then your brain doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And you're anti-Semitic.
Okay, period. There's just not there's nothing else to say. If I say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you call that um, what do you want to call if you and you call that um, fruit, different kinds of fruit. Well, then you can't read English. Those are days of the week, not fruit. Jews are Jews, not Christians. Not Gentiles. They believe in Christ, so, you know, whether you call them Christian or not, I guess you could. But they're biologically Jews who believe in Christ. It says so by tribe. Tribe is a bloodline. Okay? It's literal. If you can't read that, then you have a mental problem. And if you can't read that, then you can't read the rest of Scripture either. Another anti-Semitic doctrine, and this one is kind of surprising. If you think that you can lose salvation, or if you think you have to do other something other than believe in Christ in order to be saved, okay, the doctrine has always been believe in Christ to be saved. That's Genesis 15.6. That's what Abraham did. And when Christ is talking to the Jews in John 8, he's busy reminding them that they're not doing what Abraham did. Believe. Just believe. That's always been the doctrine. Abraham believed and it was credited to his account as righteousness. Very simple verse. Very clear. In any translation. Okay? And the whole New Testament has the same gospel in it. Period. So you're anti-Semitic if you don't believe that. If you think you have to work for your salvation, or you have to repent to be saved, or you have to, you know, feel sorry for your sins, or whatever, lordship salvation, that's all anti-Semitic. Because that's not what Abraham did. Abraham was the first Jew. And all the families of the world are blessed through Abraham. So you're not through Abraham. Because you're not doing what Abraham did. That's what Christ was saying to his fellow Jews in John 8. Okay? John 8, John 6, John 7. It was all over John. The Gospel of John is centered on that. Believe to be saved. Okay? That's what they weren't doing. Okay, so then Paul knowing this very well, explains in Romans 9 through 11, well, they're Jews, but not all Israel is Israel. Why? Because they didn't believe. Okay, so then, you're being anti-Semitic. You're not doing what a true Jew would do. See, salvation comes through the Jews. Christ said that to the Samaritan woman. Salvation comes through the Jews. Well, he's the Jew that it comes through. Okay? And he's a son of Abraham. And what did Abraham do? Abraham believed and it was credited to his account as righteousness. Now, you wouldn't expect the gospel disbelief, you know, to be an anti-Semitism. Oh, but it is. And in fact, the Pharisees themselves were being anti-Semitic when they kept on trying to work for their salvation. That's what Christ was explaining to them. You're not doing what your father Abraham did. Your father is the devil instead. He's always telling them they're not Jews. See, he's linking belief and Jewishness together. Because they are. Because that's why Abraham became righteous. Because he believed. And the sign of his belief was the circumcision. The circumcision didn't save him. The circumcision was... And uh, uh, what do you want to call it? An expression. Same thing with baptism. Baptism is an expression of belief. And that's what Paul's saying in Romans 10.10. 10. You say it because you believe it already. See my Romans 10.10 10 video. So, that's, that. I think where I'll leave it now because I'm on 35 minutes. If you don't believe Christ paid for your sins and that alone saves you, If you don't believe that's the gospel, then you're anti-Semitic and you're under strong delusion and you'll never grow up spiritually. Peace out.